Hello, everybody. Glad to have everybody. Let's see who's who made it first in the chat. Uh, so let's see. Enrique from Texas. Where, where, where's everybody viewing this from? I see Chicago, Canada, Kansas City. There's there's Ottawa. So the first one I saw from Canada was uh, Manitoba. Uh, a lot of people, Sacramento. So that's probably closer to where you are, Bambi, I, I assume. <laughs> yeah. So, Bambi, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started here in about 60 seconds. I know there are people still jumping on, uh, so we'll get started here in just a minute. And, and as people are coming on, uh, this is being recorded, so you are able to, uh, all attendees will get a link to uh, view this later. Uh, we also have, so we have Bambi, of course, you've seen that on the, on the, the sign up, but we also have Terrence Campbell with Nikon. So glad to have you, Terrence. Glad to be here. Thanks for everybody for attending. Wonderful. Now, the three of us are going to be on Zoom, but that is being pushed out to YouTube. So if you have any questions, uh, please put it in the chat. I know a lot of you are utilizing the chat. Hey, we have uh, Germany, we have Detroit, uh, a, a couple of people. We have quite a few people from Chicago coming in. Uh, Puerto Rico, uh, Oregon, Oklahoma City. Hey, there's UK. There we go. All right. <laughs> Toronto, quite a few people from, people from Canada. Love, love, to, love to see it. <laughs> And Bambi, you are where in California? What what area? I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area, the home of the um, Golden State Warriors. There you go. You know, the national champion Golden State Warriors. You know those guys. <laughs> little known team, right? <laughs> yeah, little known team. So um, now do you want me to share my screen? Just let me yes, know when you want me to get started and I will share my screen because i'm gonna do my go. I just gave you co-host permission so you should be able to uh, share your screen okay and i guess we'll go oh, and get started man. once we make sure that the screen is shared properly okay hang on a second here sure Bam, did you have time to get out get with uh, deanne while she was there photographing the golden state warriors no i didn't and i have to tell you i was pretty bummed out because I didn't get to, um, to, to be with her. So, so, okay. Can you see my screen? Okay. Yes. Coming in just fine. Looks great. Um, again, for those of you just joining us, uh, we're glad to have all of you, please put your, your questions in the chat feature here on YouTube. Uh, we're going to collect those, those questions. Uh, if there are, um, if there are some common questions being asked, we're going to ask those, uh, when when Bambi has time, but we're also going to ask uh, some questions at the end. Uh, and and you know, Bambi, if you want to take a break and, and ask questions or ask for questions, that's totally fine. Uh, we, we try to make this as flexible as possible. So uh, I think we have we have quite a few watching so far. So I think it's good to maybe go ahead and jump into it. Okay, awesome. So folks, we're going to be talking. This is wedding photography one hundred and one. Um, it's my goal that when you leave this presentation, that you have the skills to improve what you're already doing. For those of you that are budding wedding photographers, um, my information is very specific. Um, I've been where you are, and uh, that's how I got started. I, I've always known that I wanted to be a photographer. When I was a little kid, I was that person who was always in trouble. My mom called me jelly fingers. And uh, when I went to school, I was, uh, I was, uh, I always say that I graduated at the top of the bottom of my class. Um, it wasn't that I wasn't smart. I was not interested. If they had shown me how um, math or, you know, algebra, things like that could have helped me as a photographer, because I've always known I wanted to do that. I would have been all over it. I would have really wanted to learn. But as it was in those days, they didn't teach that way. You had to just learn to, for the sake of learning. Um, I'm very grateful that I got to pursue my craft as a photographer. And for those of you that have heard my presentation before, um, please bear with me as I tell a few of those that are out there that have never heard me speak. I just want to tell you briefly my story. My husband and I are from Georgia, and we moved to California in 1981. Um, I, uh, the person that photographed our wedding, we got married in 1975. We had our, just had our 47th wedding anniversary. 
And the person that photographed our wedding ruined it. Now, I can't really say she ruined it because she was an amateur with a good camera. She had that great Nikon. And I thought, hey, then she's going to be able to take great pictures. Well, one thing I learned really early is that cameras don't take pictures. People do. And that was the impetus for me wanting to become a wedding photographer specifically. So my husband walks in the door in 1981 and says, hey, how do you feel about moving to California? Well, I'd never been there. So I said, hey, let's go. So we sold our house in two weeks and moved. Don't recommend doing that. But nonetheless, it was a great experience. Um, then when we got to California, no, I didn't get a job as a photographer. I got a job as an executive secretary, which anybody that knows me knows that I like to spell creatively. And um, uh, that didn't last very long. And I'm so grateful. One of my girlfriends said to me one day, she said, hey, Bambi, I know you like to take pictures and you have a good camera. Why don't you go talk to this photographer I work with? He is looking for somebody to photograph weddings. That's the day that changed my life. Because when I'm going to his studio, he had this upstairs studio. And as I walked up the stairs to his studio, he had all these beautiful pictures on the wall. I put my hand on the doorknob to walk through the door. And I was so afraid he'd turn me down that I took my hand off the doorknob. And then I literally ran down the stairs and left the building and walked all the way down the block. And at that time, I had to stop for a stoplight. And that's when I realized how much I really wanted to be a photographer. So I sucked it up. I ran back up, ran back to the studio, walked up, up to the stairs, went in the building and I said, hi, I'm Bambi Cantrell. I'd like to talk to you about being a photographer for you. He hired me right on the spot, but how could he not? Because I told him I'd do it for free. Um, and I'm sure there's a few of you who felt that way as well. That was the best training I ever got. No, it's not for what I learned about what to do right. He taught me what to do wrong. And I learned on somebody else's dime. So I didn't, um, by the time I started my own company, I didn't make as many mistakes. Um, part of this presentation, I have a short uh, marketing program at the end uh, for those that want to stay for that. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. So now let's get into the, uh, the art of photography. And I'm going to just start by sharing with you just some of the nuts and bolts. <coughs> tools, excuse me, tools for capture. I'm using the Nikon Z9 um, for mounting my lenses at this time. I'm using the, the FTZ2 mount adapter so that I can use my existing glass um, with the Z9. I will be investing in some Z glass, though, I will tell you that. Um, I use the Nikon D850, which is such a great little workhorse, and then a variety of lenses. And for those of you that are new photographers out there, I'm not a huge proponent of buying lots of stuff. I don't want you to get in deep debt if you want to become a wedding photographer. But I will tell you, this is where, in my opinion, and I sincerely tell you that, not because Nikon is sponsoring this program, but this is really the way I feel. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy good glass and a good body because you don't get to go back. There's no second, oh, gosh, I wish I'd done this or that. Buy the good stuff to begin with, and then there are no apologies. If I can only buy one lens... I'm going to buy the 24 to 70, the Nikkor 24 to 70 to eight, not because it's my favorite lens, but it's probably the most versatile for me personally, that if I could only get one lens, if I could have two lenses, then I'm going to have the 24 to 70 and the 70 to 200 to eight, or the 105, 14, instead of the 70 to 200. That's a kind of a neck and neck. Those two are, 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 are the lenses that I use the most. I really prefer um, long lenses and I really like prime lenses personally. As you can see, I have a variety of, I have a couple of different primes. And in fact, not all my lenses are even listed on this sheet. I just ran out of room. Um, for lighting my, my subjects, I'm gonna use the SB910 Nikon speed lights. And then for, uh, if I do studio work or if I'm doing um, um, uh, formal pictures, then I'll use my Profoto B10 strobes. And I like them because they're portable. They're very lightweight. They are a terrific, terrific tool. Um, I'm using SanDisk uh, cards, the Extreme Pro CF Express cards. They're super fast and they are just absolutely awesome. After capture, um, I'm using um, Apple computers. I like the iMac personally. Um, I've used them for absolutely years. 
Um, I use Album Epica albums. They're out of Italy. Fantastic album company. And in my opinion, their customer service is by far the best there is. They're just amazing. Exposure 7 software is just great software that I use for after capturing images. Um, it's for, I can do color correcting and so forth with them. Let's see, portable hard drives. I have a number of these guys right here. And I really like them because they're super indestructible and I'm, I'm very clumsy. Um, Westcott 5-in-1 reflectors. This is my very favorite reflector. It's five reflectors in one. It has a little a zipper you can take. It's got a black side, a white side, a translucent, um, and then has a, a silver side um, and a gold, I think. So, but it's just absolutely one of the best tools out there. Sun bounce reflectors I also use. This is a more rigid reflector. Um, it's, I like it. I put it on a light stand. I have a six by four and uh, it's great. I move it around the studio because I like uh, adding just a little touch of fill um, on the subject space. And then of course, Adobe Photoshop and then Adobe Lightroom are the tools that I'm using. Now, as we go through each of these segments, at the end of each little segment, I'll have a few minutes for questions. So in that particular genre, like for instance, we're going to talk about engagement sessions now. If you have questions about engagement sessions, this will be the time to maybe ask your questions about that. OK, um, so let's talk about an engagement session. An engagement session is included with all of my coverages. It's my way of getting to know the client. It's real important for me to know what makes them tick. Who are they? So that I'm not trying to get them to do things that are uncomfortable to them. Um, this is my profession. It's not my religion. So what I mean by that is that I, I do have a unique style, but within that style, I believe that I want to try to create images that appeal to a particular client. So to give you an example, this particular client, the groom was a musician and he's very moody. He's not the kind who's going to want to be standing around and posing. He is not going to have any part of that. He's more organic and wanting things that are more behind the scenes. So in capturing images of him, I would need to photograph, especially in the beginning, in a way that would be less intrusive. Um, this is shot with just the natural light in the room. Um, I've trained myself to think, OK, where am I going to photograph in, in a particular room? Um, what can I get with what I have? I don't use a lot of extra lighting if I'm doing an engagement session because I like it to be a bit more hands off. So as you can see, the sunlight's coming through that room. I took a light meter reading off his face. One of the things I like about the Nikon equipment is that the meter in the camera is very, very accurate. And I also like the fact that I can photograph in relatively, what am I saying relatively, in very low light situations very easily. It's super, super comfortable. Now, in this particular case, I've added a bit of a filtration over the, um, the image in, uh, in post-production. And the reason I do that is sometimes because the, the photograph has a certain mood to it already, I want to enhance that mood. So this has a bit of a crackle um, um, filter over the, um, over the image, and I did that in post-production. Then there are those that are a bit more chic. And so this, this is a, an engagement couple that I did in Florida. Um, and I, I loved the way that just kind of the chase was laying there. And this was a great way. I had never met this couple. They hired me on the spot and I never met them before I did their engagement session. So I didn't really know who, who they were. So I moved them around areas in their backyard to kind of become comfortable with them. And so I always start my sessions with something that's a bit more intimate, like in this case, like them cuddling together or communicating together so that I'm able to start seeing how they interact with one another. Um, if the client comes to me and they're wearing, um, you know, torn jeans or things that are very casual, that tells me kind of the style of person that they are. I'll tell you what clothing says so much about a person. It tells us there are subliminal messages that it gives us as to who that person is. And I think that's really, really important. And so this tells me a lot about who they are. They're probably more playful. They brought their dog. And so I, I of course, wanted to incorporate their dog in some pictures. Um, one of the things that's included in my session is a clothing consultation. So in this session, this is a session I did in Palm Springs. Um, it, 
uh, we were photographing this old Adobe. And so I knew the color scheme. I went out and did a, a site check ahead of time. And I think that's a really good thing that we can do is to do a site check, because then we can kind of see how we can create harmonious images um, of that particular couple in that environment. So I saw the doors were blue and then they had these water jars that were blue. So when the bride showed me her wardrobe, I thought, oh, that'll be kind of fun. Let me incorporate that um, with um, in this particular environment. And uh, I was able to do so and have some harmonious images. The placement of the subject is really important in this scene. Placing her between them between the, the two cactuses, it draws your eye right to the subject and it really frames that subject. Um, afterwards, we went over to this other area. This is the same building, just a different environment. I try to do a few images in one spot and then I turn to look at another angle to see a different perspective. And if that gives me a lot of variety within a scene. Um, why? Because it's my goal that they're gonna buy an album of this. I don't wanna just take some happy snapshots of their face. In my head, I'm laying out an album, um, spreads in an album. And I uh, do albums for almost all of my clients. Wedding, for sure. I include weddings for my uh, wedding albums for my clients when I do a wedding. Um, and then they can, this can be an add on purchase. So it's important for me to give them lots of choices. Real quickly, I'm just going to tell you about the posing on this. You'll notice that the groom has that front leg and the knee bent slightly, and then he's leaning into the bride with his chest. That's really important. Whenever we're going to talk more about this later, but whenever you have somebody lean forward slightly, not a lot, but just slightly with the chest, straightens up the back and it makes them look more interested and more engaged. In her case, you'll notice that her knee is also bent and then she's pressing her tummy slightly towards the groom. And what that does is it kind of pulls the shoulders back a little bit and creates a bit of, of intimacy. Higher camera angles can also be a really great way to create images. Higher camera angles do a couple of things. They remove, uh, you can remove distracting things from up above. Um, you can also um, make a subject look more slender. If they're a plus size person, you can, if they want to look more slender, you can make them appear more slender by raising a camera angle. We're gonna, I'll talk to you more about this when we get to the segment I'm posing. Uh, for mature people as well. My age, I'm telling you right now, you better be on a ladder. <laughs> so um, every picture that I've ever had taken of myself pretty much is on a ladder. So if that tells you anything. Okay, so we're going to stop here for just 30 seconds. So if anyone has any questions, what we're going so far. So let's take a look. I'm not seeing any any questions as of yet, so please okay. put your questions in if you see anything. Uh, I do have a, a fan of yours, Joseph Chan, uh, says I've seen her work before. Good to see her teaching a class again. So, you thank you so much. Absolutely, well, awesome. Okay, well then let's get busy. Then we're going to talk about preparing for preparation shots. Um, on the wedding day, I'm always early. Um, I usually arrive on property wherever the bride is going to dress about three hours beforehand. Now, I know that sounds like a lot, but here's why. Because I want to be prepared for the unexpected. Um, I find that quite often that the bridesmaids are just kind of putzing around and, and not doing and just having, you know, doing girl time and not really like getting dressed or anything. And so one of the things that I'm able to do by coming on property early is to kind of you know, get things moving on so that they kind of keep on their schedule uh, a little bit. So I, I might walk up to the bridesmaids and say, hey, girls, you may want to start thinking about getting ready because that way when the bride's getting into her gown, you can be in your beautiful dresses. Wouldn't that be nice? I know you'd love to look really great, your best. Is that okay? And I'll shake my head in the affirmative. And they always like, oh yeah, that's right. We should probably think about getting ready. So, but preparation is not just that kind of thing. Preparation um, especially for the, the shots of the bride getting ready and the groom getting ready, go beyond that. It goes to lens selection. Um, where is camera position going to be when things are taking place? So lens selection for me, if I have a choice, um, I prefer to use the 8514, the 10514, or the 70 to 200 if I'm um, 
If I need to give the bride a bit more breathing room, if she's super nervous, I'm going to put on that NICOR 70 to 200 to eight so I can be back a bit and give her a bit more breathing room. Um, I'm going to walk into a room and I'm going to immediately open up the curtains or the drapes and uh, um, or turn on the lights or whatever I need to. Now, I've never known a makeup artist to um, do makeup for a bride in the dark. So you're going to have some sort of, of light direction. So if they won't allow me to open up the windows, then maybe I will pull out a video light. And I do use video light occasionally. And but position of the video light window or whatever is going to be important. And let's sh I'll show you some examples of that as we go on. So here's a diagram of exactly what I do. The subject is facing the light source. Let's say it's a window or a video light or the light from the makeup artist uh, light that she's got. Notice where camera position is. My camera position is going to be slightly forward, but to the right of the subject on the shadow side of the face. I find that it is very flattering for any subject. So if you look at this picture with this young lady, this bride, notice that beautiful shadow that's on this left-hand side of her face. It's quite lovely. I'm using a very shallow depth of field. This is maybe about 2.0 or 1.8. Um, because I don't need the entire face to be in focus. I want to isolate the forward eye and I want to isolate those lips. But what's really important to me is that there's nothing in focus in the background. That's really critical to me because the more you can keep that background from being sharp, it doesn't compete for attention. Um, the same is true. The same uh, lighting concept is if a bride is getting ready. Now, in this particular case, I've added a bit of uh, filtration after the fact um, in, um, in post-production, just because I wanted to give it a bit more of a painterly look. Um, but it's just light in a room. I did go in the bathroom and turn the light on in the bathroom so I could get a bit more dimensionality. My uh, f-stop is generally, you know, as wide open as uh, fairly wide open. If it's a, if it's, I'm not going to go to 1.4 on this. I'm probably going to shoot it maybe 2.8. Um, but I do want a bit of depth in the background. So I'm going to turn on a light in the background or something of that, that nature. There are times when I'm going to want to photograph, hang on, I'm turning my phone off to make sure it's off. Um, there are times when um, I want to tell a more comprehensive story, but there are elements that might be disturbing to the subject. To give you an example of what I mean, in this case, the bride's mother had not gotten ready yet. The bride and her mom were like that. They were super, super close. So in order to make the mother feel um, um, comfortable being photographed, I thought, hey, what a great way. I'll just photograph it, um, photograph into the light, creating a silhouette. And that way it, you don't really see what the mother has on, but we know who it is and you can see her profile. So it was a really great way to kill two birds with one stone. Notice what is, um, I've taken a light meter reading of the background and that I'm metering off the background to give me my silhouette. But I've also gone in in post-production and just slightly lightened up this side of her face just so that you could see her ear. You'll notice that there's a little highlight. I've really trained myself to pay attention to direction of light and look for highlights and shadows. So in this case, you see that nice little highlight on that back cheek. That's really important. And that's basically nothing more than the light coming in that window and bouncing off the floor or the carpet. So you can really uh, create some wonderful dimensionality in your images, paying close attention to what um, the way the natural light is falling in a room. In addition to that, again, photographing with a very shallow depth of field is really important. The only thing I did in post-production is convert it to black and white. And that's one of the things I like about that Exposure 7 software is it has really pretty black and white um, 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 uh, features to it. You can also do them in Lightroom as well. That same concept, that open windows on the left-hand side, notice how it really isolates the bride's face. So this is a time for me when I'm not really um, manipulating my subjects. I very, very seldom do I manipulate them. I really want this to be very organic and I want it to be very natural. But the great thing about doing that is that you can do, you can gain a variety of images with a single lens, and this is why those long lenses are so awesome. This is the same room 
literally within moments of capturing that other image and I'm able to do a portrait of the bride. Now, for you new photographers, this is going to be critical. So in your mind, you, you're, you're doing more than one thing. You're going from portrait thought process to um, photojournalist process. So you can do more than one type of image very, very quickly um, by, just, um, by just changing your location and um, you know, keeping that prime on, that prime lens on and sh shooting at a very shallow depth of field. The other thing I like in doing uh, or capturing when I'm doing prep shots is things that are happening naturally. So for instance, in Sprite, I knew she was gonna go in to see her, um, her younger sister. So I very much pay attention to my surroundings. And if there was a piece of advice I'm gonna give you folks that are newer, really listen, listen to what's going on. So I had, because I came early to the home when the bride was getting ready, I saw that hallway. I knew the sister that was her room down at the end of that hallway. I thought, boy, this would be a really cool environment to photograph in. So when the bride went down that hall, I went, oh yeah, I'm prepared. And this was shot with the 70 to 200, the Nikkor 70 to 200 millimeter lens. And I'm, I keep myself back from the subject and keep my uh, focus on her as she's walking through the, do through the doorway. I use back button focusing. And I really like that. I find that it's super accurate and um, that way I focus with my thumb and then I press the shutter with my finger. Um, there are, as I'm walking through a, ha a house when a bride is gonna start getting ready, I will start thinking about little vignettes for creating little stories. So when I walked in this bride's home, she had this amazing stained glass window. So I thought the first thing that before she even got dressed, I thought, you know, I'm, she had this really cool little bathroom. So I said, hey, let's, let's just take 30 seconds and go out in the um, living room. I want to do a picture of you in your living room. And so this photograph, I shot this with just the light coming through the window metered on her face. And then I used a single reflector on the silver side to just give me those little bit of highlight on her back. So I get a little bit of a highlight and shadow and highlights on her back. And that was um, very, very helpful uh, in creating, giving my subject and giving the image a bit more dimensionality. Um, when I'm photographing brides and grooms at getting ready, um, my associate photographer, Michael, does the groom. He photographs the groom while I work with the bride. And I will tell you, that is one of the most important things to have is have a second shooter. I really like it. I'm not a bit, um, I'm not too um, precious with my photography that it's all about me. It's about giving that client the very best. And Michael is outstanding in his own right. And so I had to include this in the story so that you could really see, you know, how beneficial it is. I mean, sometimes I have grooms that will allow me to go back there, but um, you know, if he's going to be in, you know, in a state, of, a state of undress, then, you know, it might be easier to have my associate do it uh, to capture those images. Not every groom wants to be photographed without a shirt on, but clearly this one was very comfortable and for a good reason. Now, this image was shot just with natural light from the light fixture up above <coughs> in the bathroom. These images, are, <coughs> excuse me, are generally going to be shot um, and then convert it to black and white because I know that we're going to get that orange kind of cast. And I just feel that it is more powerful. The story is told more powerfully in black and white. So again, same room, just very, very simple long lenses or the 85 millimeter 1.4 lens um, from Nikon is just phenomenal for this kind of thing. The reflection is really important. It's part of that story. You need, uh, I believe in order to tell the story properly, you need to see that that's part of the scene. So you can tell that that's a reflection in the, in the, um, um, uh, in the mirror. Showing some of the details that take place on a wedding day for the groom, as well as the bride. You can see, notice again, this goes back to the way things are lit. Um, an open doorway in this particular case, just an open door to the outside. Notice how that light skims across his body. And because we're photographing pretty much on the shadow side of the body, you can see the texture, the texture of his tie. You can see the cufflinks. You can see, you know, kind of the texture of the shirt, which to me is just really gives it a bit more um, interest. Um, I will, uh, as you can see, this is the very same concept, just, just photographing the bride. This is one of my images of, of my bride getting ready. Um, 
your eye naturally goes to the lightest thing in the picture. So I want to make sure that that's why camera position is so important in relation to the light source. If I photograph from the same direction as the light source, that white of her um, top is going to become way overpowering. And that's all you're going to see. I tell you what, there's so much beauty that happens when a couple is um, getting ready. I love expressions. So this really goes back to using those um, longer lenses when couples are, or, or when the bride is getting dressed. I just absolutely love the, uh, the beauty that takes place in a room with somebody. Notice the soft light that's on the bride on the left-hand picture, that really pretty soft light. Um, um, just again, this is just, these are both just shot with natural light. And there was a window on each side from behind and also on the, on the left-hand side. If I, um, in, whenever I'm creating an album design, this is actually a page layout from one of my books from her wedding. And um, the fold is right down the center. I'm going to caution you about putting too many pictures in a book. Um, don't make it look like a yearbook. It really just takes away the beauty and you lose impact. I will tell you, impact is absolutely everything for a wedding. If you don't have impact, if you're just telling the, the one plus one is two stuff, um, then you're not going to, you don't really get the, um, you don't get, there's no impact. Then you lose the clients, you lose that emotional response. So um, I knew when they, again, because of paying close attention, I knew the bride was going to get uh, a little note from her, her husband to be. So by creating a couple of series of images, I said, okay, well, she's going to read that. I'm going to place a chair over there by that window. And the only thing I said to her, um, I said, hey, could I, if you're going to read your husband's, could you do it by this window? And that way, uh, also where the, the dry wedding gown placement was critical. I wanted that to kind of set the stage as to what is being, what is taking place. Um, again, using shallow depth of field, really um, focusing in on that face, the dress, it's, it's, it's okay for it to go slightly softer. Um, I'm able to tell a more dynamic story. Um, I'm not such a hardcore photojournalist that I wouldn't say to somebody, hey, could you come over here to do this or that, um, you know, closer to the window? Um, it'll make for a prettier photograph. You know, again, this is about the client um, and I'm going to just do whatever I can to make, you know, to make it look the very best that it possibly can. Um, I shoot with two cameras. Um, one of them has the 24 to 70 lens on it. And the other one has a longer lens or a prime on it. and for this very reason. So when dad comes in to see his daughter in her wedding gown using a 24, this is why I, I have to say as much as I don't like that lens, it's not my favorite lens, but it is an important tool to have. Um, I try to crop as much as I can in the camera um, when I'm taking them. It means less work post-production. So I don't want to have to go, well, I can crop that later. I'm not gonna say I don't ever do it, but I try my best to crop it in the camera, then that way I'd have less work. But I just love the series of images. This I know is going to be an important sequence to put, um, and it'll be a double page spread in an album. And by using that particular tool, that great 24 to 70, um, that's the start, zooming in a little tighter and then tighter still. Um, and again, because I went in that bedroom ahead of time and opened up those drapes, I knew where my camera position needed to be in relation to the light source to capture these images in real time. Which leads me to this. Um, in this particular case, when I scoped out this house, um, I saw those two double doors and then this beautiful staircase. And I thought, this is for sure a spot that I could see in my head that I wanted to photograph this bride going down the staircase. So I try to stack the deck in my behalf. So first thing I did was when I got there, I had my assistant um, and my, my uh, second shooter, Michael, I said, hey, I want you to stand down at the bottom of that staircase so I can get my composition. I want to go ahead and play it out in my head so that when real time happens that I'm not going, oh, could you stop right there, do this or that? I can actually capture it in real time because I've already laid the foundation for what it's going to look like. I know what where she needs, where I need to stand. I know what it's going to look like as she walks down that staircase. And as you can see, this was a prime spot to have her be because notice that bit of highlight on her hair and the background is darker. So it really isolates the subject 
it really isolates her nicely. So I'm able to capture this. Um, this round part of the staircase is really important for my composition. And then once I did that, I knew when she, I said, when she got to the bottom of the staircase, I said, well, now uh, this is a spot where I'm going to do a portrait. Stand still, stay there for just a second. I came down the stairs and I was able to, to get this photograph in very, very short time. And notice how all the lines lead to the subject. The staircase points down to the subject. The light fixtures point to the subject. The subject is in that, that, um, that right third of the picture. Um, and because I, had, I already had it laid out in my head ahead of time, I knew that there was gonna be this nice little highlight on the banister of the, the railing of the staircase. So it kind of separates the staircase and then gives us those highlights and shadows and highlights. It gives us some dimensionality. Um, with uh, uh, the groom and his mom, this house I scoped out ahead of time. So I knew what, I knew in my head ahead of time, because it's a real dark room, I knew where I was going to need to be ISO wise. I knew what lens, what I would want to have on. So when the groom is in there talking with his mom, I was able to go in very quickly, say, hey, can I get you to come in closer together? Bam, and get it very quickly. Because it's been my experience. And again, this goes to those new photographers out there. It's been my experience that um, the thing that separates the amateur from the pro is the ability to do a beautiful job quickly and concisely. There is nothing more excruciating than having you take forever to get a shot. It may be the best hero shot you've ever taken in your life, but if the client did not enjoy the experience, they are never, ever going to recommend you to their friends and they're going to hate their pictures because all they're going to remember is this was just excruciating and they took forever. So learn to take your time, learn to go ahead of time and isolate your uh, subject and get what you need to get. And you know what? You don't have to have a camera in your hand to do that. This is the way that I do it. And this is the way that I trained myself very early in my career. Without a camera in my hand, I thought to myself, okay, I'm sitting in a restaurant. If I had to photograph right here and now, where is my chosen um, where's my chosen location? How could I get what I needed to get if I'm going to do a portrait? So I could start laying out in my head scenarios in, uh, in just different kinds of environments. And that way, when a situation, when a natural situation occurs, like with the bride getting ready, I'm like, oh, okay, I've already laid it out in my head where I need to be in relation to light, da, da, da. And I'm able to, in real time, capture those. Um, rather than uh, try to do too much my recommendation to you is learn one fundamental, learn one thing, and then really work at, at perfecting that, and then move on to the next fundamental. I find that it's been my experience that if you try to learn everything, the history of the universe, part one and two, that you aren't good at anything, and that it really is very overwhelming. So, and, and these concepts, by the way, aren't just for weddings. They're also for portraits or photographing your children, um, your grandkids. In my case, I have two grandchildren. So all of these concepts that I've learned in photographing a bride getting ready in her in her bedroom or a groom in his in his bathroom, those concepts are concepts and they can apply to a variety of scenes, including nature photography, flowers, whatever. So now that we've come to posing, um, does anyone have any questions before we move on? Okay. All right, I'm sure you'll have tons of questions at the end. Okay, so posing fundamentals. Um, I do believe that posing is an important part of wedding photography um, because if it's not important that they look good on their wedding day, they would just have an amateur, you know, take their pictures. But we, 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 wanna, look, we wanna look our best. And that's one of the things that separates a professional from an amateur is the ability to take a given situation and make the best of that situation. So let's talk about um, posing fundamentals. I've never known a single woman who wanted to look fatter and flatter than she is. Never known a single one. We always want to look you know, younger, thinner, prettier, more curvaceous, whatever. So here are some tips. Bend the joints. If there's a joint, you bend it. Higher camera angles are very flattering for mature subjects. Have the subject slightly lean forward to appear more engaged. 
relax and engage with your subject. Have them engage with one another. I find that that's such an important tool for getting real smiles versus those fake smiles that people put on for people that they don't know. Separate the feet, bend one knee for a more relaxed look. So just going back to this one, uh, one element, um, having the subject slightly lean forward to appear more engaged. Notice what happens if I just sit back like this. What is my body language? What is my body language telling you? Notice what happens if I do one thing. Do you see how I immediately became more engaged? I looked more friendly. I looked more um, interested in you. So that one concept is really important, but I also recommend that you have the subject lean forward with the chest because people have a tendency to go roll their shoulders forward like this. Now, in some cases like this little girl, it's fine because she's a little skinny girl and, and you know, she can do pretty much anything. But for those of us that have a little bit more meat on our bones, having us roll our shoulders forward is not very flattering. So if you have the subject lean with their chest forward slightly, it straightens up the back, straightens up the shoulders, and is a more flattering angle on that subject. So that really does make a difference, and it makes just about anyone look well. Um, one of the things, by the way, I will caution you, you'll notice I'm using, when I say to lean forward, I use the back of my hand. So with if, I'm, um, if, as a, if I were a man, for a female, I would not use the front part of my hand and say, hey, lean towards my hand with your chest. That sounds really creepy. But notice what happens if I say, just lean towards my hand with your chest. See how that automatically looks less scary and, and it looks inv does not look invasive. So those are really just a few tips for you. So let's put that into practice. So how can we use those tips? So first of all, notice with this young woman, we're taking that element that we learned earlier about using the light coming from a window, photographing from the shadow side of the face. What does that do to her chest? Do you notice how we have the light skimming across her chest giving her body, giving her cleavage. It gives her more curves. Now, if you photograph someone straight into the light, there's no cleavage right here. And so there's no uh, curves. So it flattens out their bust and it makes them look very, um, um, it makes them just look flat and fat. So in this case, having that light skimming across the body can be really flattering for your subject. That's one thing. The next thing is bending those joints. Notice the joints that are bent. Even the arm on the, the left-hand side, the arm on the right-hand side is bent. And then even the wrist is bent just slightly. That slight bend to the wrist gives that, that hand grace. So we can do this. You can see how the hand, if it's real straight, it looks just very stiff. Now, if I just bend that wrist, it just naturally is very, um, it, it looks more graceful. Also notice that we're only lighting this part of the hand. So this part, see how I've got the main light. In fact, in my, in my case, I've got an open window right in front of me. See how much bigger my hand looks that way than this way? Because now just the edge of my hand is illuminated. And then also you can't see it, but she's also got a knee bent. I'm bending that one knee. So that really does make a, a big difference. Um, that leaning forward slightly, keeping their shoulders back. See how that gives her, it gives her body a bit more energy. It just makes her look just a bit more um, um, like uh, engaged. Now, in this case, just from a lighting standpoint, I'm using that pro photo um, uh, light with an umbrella to just isolate her face. We're balancing out the light from the background to the foreground um, and illuminating her. In this case, I'm using a high um, F number about F11. So the background is nice and crisp. And then there are times when, for instance, with this groom, you'll notice that he's got his head bent. In this case, I've got his shoulders back and his head just kind of slightly bent down. Um, the, I shot this in real time. Um, you just, you know, I, I saw the statue and I thought, oh, that'd be a really cool spot to place him in um, to photograph him just with an open door. Um, Notice the, the hand placement, the, the hand placement in this picture. Just again, using just shallow depth of field. Again, this was shot with just the 70 to 200 to eight lens. Very, very, it really just allows me to just blur out the background and get that beautiful light on her face. In this case, I'm using a reflector, but the white side of the reflector so that it's just real soft light. 
Um, and that way um, I can really just give her face, just fill in the, 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 the face, but still have a bit of that shadow on that left-hand side. Notice how the shoulders are. In this case, she just kind of is leaning just a little bit. There's just a little bit of, of attitude in the shoulders. Speaking of attitude, clothing has a lot to do with what kind of style you, you can, what you can get away with from attitude. So with this bride, she was very, very fashion forward. Bringing that shoulder forward, this works really well because of two things. The direction of light, number one, the light is coming from this right-hand side, skimming across, and where is camera position? I'm photographing on the shadow side of that shoulder. If I scooted around this way and photographed her straight into the, you know, from the light side, it's going to do two things. It's going to make that shoulder look very large, make it look bigger than her face because there's, it's a large mass area. And then it's also going to uh, make her, she's going to, um, her dress is going to absorb more of that light and it's going to detract from her face. So photographing on that shadow side is a, has many, many benefits um, to the subject. One other thing, if you, sometimes it's the, the larger girls like to wear an off the shoulder dress or a strapless dress. This is a very flattering angle for them as well, because photographing on that shadow side really can make, will make those shoulders look and those arms look a bit more narrow. Um, this is uh, bending those joints, bending a knee, how critical it is. Notice what's going on. The kind of dress that she has picked out is very figure forming, very figure flattering. The best part of this dress that's showing you, she's really had it cropped or she's had it tailored so that it's very tight around her knees. So by having her bend that back knee, she's got one knee bent. The other one is straight. It puts the tension on the, on the butt uh, muscles. And then it really makes that one butt cheek kind of just pop out. So it really is a great way to show the curves of your subject. The, this forward arm, having it bent slightly, having that little bit of a highlight right there really makes her, gives her, it shows off the curves of her body. It's a really flattering way to photograph a subject. Um, also, I did several of her in this room and I also photographed her straight from the back. But again, you wanna bend one of those knees. So what I would recommend that you do is learn to do this by doing it on yourself. So if you stand up and that you, and if I have you just, you know, take your feet and then bend one of your knees. You can see how your how how it shifts the weight and it gives you a bit more tension in the back. And a lot of times, brides will purchase a wedding gown based upon the back of the dress or based upon their best feature. So with grooms, I want those images to be very relaxed and very casual. Um, sometimes we do a lot of storytelling imagery. So in this case, if it's you know the the cityscape, then we're gonna open those doors slightly so that you can really see out there and take a meter reading off the subject. Again, shot in just, with just the natural light. Um, my uh, associate photographer, Michael, shot these two images. Notice how um, there's just, you get, he has that cool factor. He gets, it's very relaxed and very casual. Um, and a lower camera angle is also a great way to make him look more formidable. Hands, uh, high camera angles, hands right up at the, uh, on the bride's shoulder. Guess what that hides, kids? It hides anything going on here. So the worst thing that you can do with mature women is to photograph them from here or down from a lower camera angle. All you're doing is maximizing this area, which is not our best. So, and this mom is just a, a lovely woman. So by having her put her hand on her daughter's shoulder and then lean forward slightly with the chin, I'm able to take and, and hide any of that. It means no, I don't have to do any po much post-production. I don't have to do very much of that. And then it, it's something that, that they will, they see that is photographing them in their best light. Same is true with the dad. I mean, look at that. You can really appreciate how that higher camera angle, by the way, also, um, uh, opens the eyes more. So if you have a subject who tends to, when they, when they smile, that their eyes disappear, you know, cause they're, they, they, um, they tend to squint or whatever, a higher camera angle, mature women, for instance, a higher camera angle on a mature woman is a great way to open those eyes up as well. So like if, if we have that upper bag on our eyes, it's a great way to make those eyes appear larger. So it's a terrific tool, 
um, for photographing um, a concept. So a ladder goes with me on every one of my weddings. Always. I'm taking a, I have a four foot step ladder that I bring and it goes with me every single place I go to because I know a higher camera angle is going to be my best friend for minimizing unattractive backgrounds, for making people appear more slender, for getting rid of any of this double chin action that's going on here. So it's a really, really a great tool to use. Um, it's also a great tool to use um, if you're doing first looks. So for the, in this case, I set myself up to where um, I, um, um, where I knew I, to get the best shot. So my associate photographer, Michael, is going to um, open that door. And so that, and so that I know, and first thing I do is focus on the groom with the door slightly open. Number two, I'm focus, focusing on her as, you know, as she sees him or, or as she's coming out the door. I love the expression on people's faces. And then third, um, I'm going to capture the look on her face, but where's Michael at? Well, He's going to actually, since he's opened that door, he's actually standing there. I don't have a picture of it in here for you to see, but he's also capturing the look on the groom's face as he sees his bride for the first time. So this is a great way for us to maximize um, um, and get really great reactions. Long lenses are awesome for this kind of thing. And I feel that it really does help us to, to tell a more uh, comprehensive story that really says so much. I mean, Emotion. I mean, look at the emotion on those faces. It's just fantastic. Um, longer lenses sometimes aren't your best friend for this kind of a scene. Sometimes you need to um, photograph in a way so that you can. Uh, and so the wider angle lenses might be your best friend for this kind of scene. Um, it was a super duper hundred degree uh, wedding. Very, very hot. Probably the hottest day on record in Pasadena. So I'm looking for locations that I can capture imagery without uh, without putting my subject through a lot of misery being in the hot heat. So it was it, it was a, a, a more um, comfortable location to photograph them and bringing them inside. In this case, here's one more thing that you can do that I think is can really be a, a very helpful tool is if your clients are agreeable. And for you new photographers, this may be something to consider. See if they're open to seeing one another before the wedding and doing their uh, romantic pictures on another day. Um, I'm not ashamed to do that. I, I don't do it very often because a lot of my clients are traditional, but there are times when I have a client that will be willing to do that. And I will tell you, this was one of those, one of those weddings. Why? Because the week that I was shooting this wedding, it was extremely hot. They were having a, um, 105 degree temperatures in Pasadena. So we chose to do the, the, the pictures of just the bride and groom two days prior to the wedding. We took a two hour window and then we did those images. And that way um, for, the, for the reception and for the wedding itself, um, we knew that if, if I tried to do everything in one day, by the time the ceremony happened, this girl is gonna be a mess. And so would the groom. So giving them a, an, an extra day to do those pictures would mean that we would have a bit, they would have a bit more of a relaxed time. And I'm not so worried about her getting totally trashed, you know, on a wedding day. So are, are you with me on that? I think, I hope that you get kind of get where I'm going with this. So I think that we have to really try to think smartly. And especially sometimes when you have these really horribly hot days, um, and especially in Pasadena, not only was it hundred degrees, but it was also very, very humid. Lower camera angles are also great for getting pictures of the groom and the groomsmen. Um, long lenses, you can really just have them. This is a great way to have them enjoy themselves, get them engaged in the experience, and then you start getting them to where they, they are enjoying having their picture taken. Okay, to strobe or not to strobe. There are times when I do um, use studio strobes. I use pro photo strobes when I need them. And I'm going to show you some examples of when I might. Okay. Um, for instance, if it's a church wedding or if it's a wedding that's indoors after dark, um, my setup is going to be this. Two pro photo strobes with umbrellas are going to be behind the camera, about uh, the camera about about here. My goal is to flat light the subjects. I want everybody to be their faces to be illuminated. 
And you can tell this is flat lighting. I mean, there's not any shadows on their faces. It's pretty much flatly lit. <clears throat> and it's a little bit, it's higher than the camera level, which is why you get that little bit of shadow under the chin, which is really great. Um, that's when I'm going to use it. I'm going to slow down my shutter speed a little bit. So I might photograph at a 30th of a second or a 15th of a second. Um, I can handhold quite easily. I can handhold camera at a fourth of a second. I'm, I don't hardly ever use a tripod. But also, and this is the same lighting setup. <clears throat> and it's also set up a bit higher as well, as you can see. You can see that there's a little bit of shadow underneath uh, uh, underneath their chin. But And this is a great way to um, just give me that really pretty light. Now, why did I do it here? This is that wedding where it was 150 degrees outside. So we did their formal pictures indoors. Also, I want you to notice what they're wearing. This family is a bit more formally bent. They're, that, they're a bit more of a traditional family. Um, so I'm not going to do all kinds of crazy um, funky posing on somebody like that because it's just not their style. So I try to really interpret who I'm working with. Notice how I'm using furniture to be able to, to give me my, uh, my groupings of people. So here's how it goes. I'm looking for triangular shapes. Notice there's a triangle between the three guys on the left. There's a triangle between the groom and the gentleman down below. And then there's another triangle between the three on the, on the right. Um, so the good thing about using this, this uh, dual lighting setup is that you can crank out these formal images really, really fast. It takes me about, I'd say 30 minutes to do an entire group of images and that's bridal party, the whole thing, bride and groom with the bridesmaids, groomsmen and so forth. What I do is I whittle the large groups down to the small groups. So I start with the big groups and then I will have people step out of the photograph. So if I'm doing the, um, the for instance, if I'm doing this kind of a shot, then uh, this is the bride and her brothers and her bridesmaids or her three sisters. I may say, hey guys, step out of the photograph. And then I'll have the other bridesmaids step in. So we don't have to move those three girls. So it means, or the bride for that matter. So you want to start thinking smartly. Who do I need to move? Because the more you move the bride, the more time consuming. It's just got that big poofy dress. So in this case, with this bride and her, or the bridal party, all I would need to do is to say to the, um, to the, the uh, groomsmen, hey guys and the groom, step out of the photograph and the, groom, the little ring bearer. Then all I need to do with the girls is move them in slightly closer and we're ready to rock and roll. I don't have to move the bride. Then I can set her. Then I can say, hey, ladies, you're free to go. Step out of the picture. Bride's free to go. Then work with just the groom and his groomsmen. Because again, the less that I have to move the bride, the better off I am. There are times though when outside, you have to just do things a little bit differently. This was an outdoor wedding uh, or an outdoor scenario for the, uh, for the, they wanted all their pictures taken outside. Notice how they're leaning a bit towards the camera. This is a great way to take that, that um, photograph and make it less formal. Why did we choose to do things a little bit less formal? Well, look at the bridesmaids. They're not all wearing the same dress. What does that tell you? That tells me that the bride is not, all that formal that, that these kind of it's not per, important to her that everybody be absolutely perfectly posed so having something that's a bit more playful worked for the particular subject that i was working with well you know there are some times when you just have crazy things happen so this um bride wanted her bridal pictures done on the beach i don't know if you can tell it or not but we're talking 50 mile an hour gale force winds so in order to make this work, what I did is I just said, you know, let's just get playful. What tells me by looking at the subjects and at the bride that I could do something a bit more playful? Well, look at the dresses that the girls are wearing. They're wearing these really fun, playful dresses. So this is a good example of making the best from a bad situation. I mean, it was just howling force winds. You can really see how much it's, uh, how windy it is by looking at the ground. So I try to interpret each event, and this is just done with just the natural light that's out there. And I have to say the background was amazing. So now it's all in the details. So I do believe that it's important. A good rounded wedding is going to show the details that people spend lots and lots of money on their decor and so forth. So I try to find an interesting way to tell a story. Well, how about the fact that the bride is in the other room getting her makeup done? I took the bridal gown and I hung it on the chandelier. 
uh, in this dark room. And that way I could create a picture that had more, that was more than just the bride getting ready. You know, it, it was a way to interpret the scene a bit more um, using just um, the 70 to 200 millimeter two eight lens backed up to capture that. Right after that, um, I chose to photograph the, all the bouquets and all the bouquets came. So I thought, well, let's use the same scene. And the dog walks in the room. I thought, great, I get a chance to document their very important family pet. Um, sh shot with the same lens. So very, very quickly, I can get images like this in just no time at all. And again, you can see where that dog walked into the room, that window highlights him and separates him from the background. Details of the cake. This is one you're going to really want that good glass. You're going to want that uh, 105, 14 millimeter lens um, because look at that beautiful detail, that soft light, um, really, really pretty. And now in this case, this was a, a tented wedding. So it, the natural environment worked really well with this. But also slowing down your shutter speed if you have all kinds of really cool decor. Uh, on this wedding, they had um, this funky room with all of these really funky bright lights. This is where uh, um, a, a using um, a camera that, that is very effective in low light situations can be your best friend. So I could literally walk into this room and increase my ISO so I could capture this in real time um, using that, uh, the, the, um, the Nikon Z9 camera is just a phenomenal tool for being able to capture an image like this. Um, obviously, I'm going to go and capture a lot of the decor of the room. These are going to be a page, uh, these are going to be a composite on a page, so the client gets to remember all those wonderful things. And I want you to pay attention to the drapery in this room. That's going to be important in the next few minutes. You're going to see how I used that drapery. So again, just capturing a lot of the decor of the room. Let's talk a minute for light is light. In other words using alternative light sources or other, using light in a different way. There's so many things that you can do um, to capture a more interesting photograph when you're using an existing light source. For instance, a bright sunny day. In this case with this bride, um, she, the, I love this house that she was having her wedding at was very vibrant, this bright red building. Um, I, I just saw how the, the shadows on this wall were playing with this, uh, this cactus plant. I thought, wow, that'd be really a cool spot. So I just basically placed her right there. Notice how she's, her, uh, her body is um, uh, turned a bit away from the light source. The light is really, you know, up very high. It's a very bright sunny day. Took a light meter reading off of her face and captured it in real time. It's not necessarily a perfect image, but I think it's actually more interesting because of the way those bright lights and that highlights and the shadows are playing with that subject. How about nighttime um, using um, videographer's light? Um, I'm gonna show you in a few minutes how we're using video light to capture all kinds of really interesting um, uh, uh, kinds of experiences. A videographer's light. So sometimes the videographer will come out with me and I actually like him. I go, hey, can you videotape from over here and use your light so that I can get a more interesting photograph? I'm going to do this. This image is not going to be flash filled. I want that beautiful mood. So I'm going to take a light meter reading off their face using the in-camera meter and then capture it in real time. How about using that videographer's light to capture shadows behind the subject? And then also first dance. Um, of course, I'm gonna do some of the pictures during first dance, I'm gonna flash film and I'm gonna tell you how I do that in a minute. But sometimes I feel that just the mystery of just seeing shadows and highlights with a subject can really get, create a much more interesting photograph. So I'm gonna meter off the groom's face. You'll notice, by the way, higher camera angle. During the reception when people are dancing, Quite often I'm on my four foot ladder so I can change the perspective, get a higher vantage point. Um, and, and you'll see in a moment how I'm using that to, to be able to get a more interesting photograph. Using, this is just done in an elevator, just the light that was from that light fixture in an elevator to capture an interesting photograph of the subject. Again, I'm turning, you'll notice I'm turning that face towards the light source. Um, I really like this kind of lighting. I find it is just so interesting and it's so easy to do. And this is a great way for you to add um, some drama to your uh, wedding, uh, your, your wedding imagery. 
And then how about outside after dark at 11 o'clock at night? This client got married after dark. And, and by the time they um, uh, we did their, some of their pictures, they really wanted the outside of this house. They wanted me to show off the outside of the house. So here's what we did. The first thing I did is I had my assistant come out. I said, I want you to stand in this spot so I can take a light meter reading um, so I can do an exposure so I can see what, what exposure is needed for that house to show up well. And also for you to show up in a silhouette on that. Then I used my video light. I had my assistant use my video light, called the bride and groom out. It was also, by the way, 20 degrees outside. It was super, super cold. So I knew she's wearing a strapless dress. I wasn't going to be able to have them out there for a long time. So by doing it, by having my ducks in a row ahead of time, by planning ahead, I could capture this photograph literally in five minutes. Have my subject stand there, have my assistant on the ground, aiming the video light up at them. And then I just said, hey, start twirling her. Bam, bam, bam. Get three shots. And I was able to capture it in real time and, and able to capture one of my favorite pictures I've ever taken in my life. I really like this. Because this shows how you can really create something by using your existing light sources and then maybe just add a little snap to it with a video light. Um, again, going back to that little couple we had earlier, using um, 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 I'm using just the light coming from outside. And that is just the, the main light. The sun is coming from almost overhead, um, metering on the subject to be able to capture this. Pomp and ceremony, ceremony pictures. How are we doing? Are we doing okay? I know where it's like 937, so I don't want to. I think we're doing just, pretty well. Okay, you just have to tell me if I'm if I'm if you're gonna kick me out of here. <laughs> no problem. We we do have some questions coming in, so not a okay, problem. Okay, well, give me some questions real quick while we've got um and we'll um I can I'll blow through this fast. Sure. Uh so I had uh first one to see here. Um, do you have any filters that uh, do you use filters on all of your photos? Uh, I don't use filters on all of them, but I do use filters on the ones that are, there's quite a few in here that have filters on them that sometimes I like to use, um, especially for black and white. I find that sometimes a filter it can be a really good tool to have. Um, gosh, I have so many of them. I can't, I can't even begin to tell you. I, I like, I like them for different things. So I would go online um, for some of the different, um, like Lara Jade has some, some of them I've created myself, um, you know, with cement on the, the ground and, you know, a, a wall, things of that nature. Um, but if they will send me an email uh, at Bambi at CantrellPortrait.com, I'll go through my list and I'll pull up uh, some, uh, uh, the names of some for you to look at. Okay. Any other question before we move on? Um, let's there were there were quite a few, but it was it was I think it was more of a general thing. I think we could ask this after this uh, last oh, okay. um, segment. Okay, perfect. Okay, so pomp and ceremony. Um, these are the lenses that I'm going to use. I'm going to use flash if I need it. Uh, so I'll be this is when I might use my SB nine ten. Um, a variety of different lenses to capture those moments. Um, we like to just capture things that that, that are happening um, that are just more than just um, literal. Uh, uh, you know, this is what you've got, you know, so look for reflective surfaces um, when you're photographing at the church. One of the things I've discovered that I really like doing, um, if I can, is I find that um, I like to, to wander around the church ahead of time so that you kind of see what the lighting is going to be like and what's going to go on. So for instance, in this case, this is an outdoor wedding. I just loved capturing this, this dad outside just before the bride was walking down the aisle. And so the thing that's interesting is that that I try to do is I like to get my composition, even if it's a candid image, even if it's an image that's unprompted, I want it to be composed properly. So I try to train my eye to look for look for camera angles where I'm going to have separation. Like I wouldn't have put this dad behind that um, that tree because it's there's not much light over there, and it would not have given him it would not have isolated him properly in that scene. But there are times when, um, in this case, this is this is with just the natural light coming from the there. There's a side door that they left open because it was so ridiculously hot. Thank goodness. Um, um, and so I had them leave that side door open, so it just the light was skimming across on the dad's face. Uh, this is my one of my very favorite times to photograph is when the bride's walking down the aisle with her dad. I love the expressions of the people around them. <clears throat> um, 
Longer lenses are going to be my friend. <coughs> I'm also going to photograph on my ladder, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> if possible for my outdoor weddings, because I'm able to get a higher vantage point. I love this to me. This is about the groom. So you have to ask yourself, what is the moment about? My associate photographer, Michael, is going to be photographing from a different camera angle. This is to me my money shot. I really want faces. For me personally, I want faces. I want expressions. Um, you can tell this is taken from a higher camera angle <clears throat> so that you can get the people behind and then the dad's uh, the kind of that wonderful expression off the dad as well. Um, depending on the ceremony, some, some religious services don't allow you to photograph much during the ceremony. Um, for those that don't allow much photography, that's when um, I'm going to use a long lens and I'm going to be very, very discreet. I don't want to know the rules of the church because if I know the rules then I have to abide by them, but if I don't know them, then I can, then I can kind of have a bit more flexibility and apologize for what I've done. Um, I will tell you this, that I'm, I am not, um, there have been times when I've had like, for instance, priests during the, uh, after, before the ceremony come up to me and they go, this one time, this little bitty priest about four feet tall comes up to me and he goes, little lady, you have 15 minutes to get these people out of this church. And I looked at him and I put my finger in his face. And I said, and you know what that means, honey? Don't you go rattling on and cut into my time with the bride and groom. Now, I'm not recommending that you do that with all your clients, um, but but there are times when you're able to get away with playing and just having a, a having a more relaxed approach with with those that are the officiant and such. Um, I, I do believe that it's important for us to get to get more than just one or two shots. So we're photographing as this couple is walking out and out and out. And um, you'll notice that how much more relaxed the faces get as they as they walk out of the building. It's just is so awesome. Um, I'm usually using a longer lens. My associate photographer is using a wider angle lens so that as we get them walking out of the building that we're get, able to get two different perspectives of that kind of thing. Bride and groom romantics. We're gonna just go through these really quickly here. <clears throat> um, for my bride and groom romantics, I really want, I like to take them away from the scene. And here's how I do it. Sometime usually during the wedding reception, um, there's a bit of downtime. Maybe it's uh, after people have had their meal. That may be a great time to take your subject away for a few private photographs. My goal is to take them out for no more than about 10 or 15 minutes. So I've ahead of time scoped out where my spots are going to be. So this was a wedding that was in November. So there was no leaves on the trees and they loved outdoor photography. So I made sure I said, oh, this is great. First spot I want to take them to is to this particular location because I wanted to have uh, that them kind of walking out of the scene. So by planning ahead in your mind, then you're able to be able to in real time go, okay, well, this is where we're going now. And this is where we're going to go, you know, and go one, two, three. And that way we're able to capture some images that have real meaning. Um, where possible, I'm going to use just the natural available light. So in this case, for this couple, it was a bright sunny day. When I did these pictures of them, I wasn't worried about, um, um, you know, I didn't have to bring a lot of extra gear along. So I'm going to have one lens, give me the best lens. It's going to give me the biggest bang for my buck. I've got a second lens on my second camera. And that way I can take them out for a few minutes and do some imagery of them. Um, that 70 to 200 lens, I'm telling you the Nikon 70 to 200 is my, one of my very, very favorite lenses because I can blur out all kinds of junk. <laughs> I can get rid of things and I can make it a much more intimate experience. Um, I really try to have them naturally be engaged with one another. So I'm not looking necessarily for perfection. I'm looking for expression. But when I do want something that's more perfect, um, I want to be able to take a variety of images very quickly. So for instance, in this case, without having to move the bride, all I needed to do with the groom is say, just turn your head slightly towards that light source. So she basically didn't have to move at all. So literally in one nanosecond, I could create two different images that are that look a bit uh, a bit different from one another without having to move your subjects too much, especially in her case, because I don't want to totally trash her. Um, in addition to that, I believe that the moment before the kiss is better than the kiss. You don't want to get them to do the fish face. So one of the things that I try to do is have them lean forward with the chin slightly and then slightly open the mouth. 
That's a terrific way to give, to make an image of the kiss look more intent, uh, intimate. Um, in addition to that, I really like having that bit of sunlight. I position where I do, so that sunlight behind them just creates a nice rim on their faces, again, using long lenses. Notice what she's hugging the groom with, she's hugging him with the side of her head here. So I'm very body part specific. She's actually barely sitting on the edge of that bench so that it gives her body room to lean into the scene slightly. And then I had her put her hands around his head. And then I said, I want you to hug him with this part of your face. By being specific and what you want them to do, um, this allows for an image that looks more graceful and more believable. Because if you just tell somebody to hug, generally we just kind of curl into them and make it more of a bear hug. You can do beautiful images literally anywhere. You don't have to have a big fancy park. You don't have to have a beautiful columns or whatever. I shot this just inside a restaurant. Um, super, super simple. They're just sitting on the back of the seats of the restaurant and capturing just this image of the two of them. Notice how she's kind of leaning into him with her chest. Keep In this case, I want that shoulder down. So I'm going to tell her, I want you to pull your shoulders down just a little bit uh, to capture this. But it basically means that you can photograph literally anywhere. So I can go from image A to image B just like that um, by scoping out the location first and then being able to, and then in visualizing where you wanna go, what you're going to capture um, ahead of time. Uh, if you have a location like this one and it's 50 miles an hour and the wind is blowing like crazy, well then you'd better get them doing something more animated like, like here. And I'm, I'm actually up on a bluff uh, to capture this image. Notice how the bride is positioned in this photograph. You'll notice that he's kind of, the groom is leaning into her. That's really an important element for creating believability. Um, one of the things that the reasons I've got her turned the way she is, I'm trying to work in the same direction as the wind is blowing so that it's not blowing in her face. So by having him, uh, having her turn slightly this way, having, he's kind of basically um, holding that veil down in the back as well so that it doesn't blow all over her head. I really believe it's important to capture lots of images of the decor and the way that the environment that a person um, has, has chosen. So again, it goes back to, in my case, I wanna make sure that compositionally it's too good. Look at the little mountains on the right-hand side and it's, the subject is framed by the, <clears throat> by the castle on the left-hand side. Um, having them you know, just become more intimate. I usually tell people I want you to hug with your forehead but then there is just nothing like having two people just walk and just have them enjoy each other's company. Higher camera angle makes all of the difference in the world. Higher camera angle and a longer focal length lens makes a huge, huge difference. Um, and then I can, uh, it doesn't matter where they're at, what environment they're in. That's why I go back to the fact that I would really recommend if you gotta get, this is why it's important to me. If you gotta buy something for a wedding, Get good glass, buy long lenses, because even if you're photographing in that first church of Uglyville, you can still photograph, do beautiful images if you're not dependent on a pretty location to create beautiful images. Um, this is exactly what it looks like when you tell somebody to hug with their forehead. So you'll notice she just kind of, I've had her lean forward to the stage. I want you to hug him with your forehead. It's amazing to see what happens, the transformation with people when you have them do that. Framing your subjects. Notice that the darker leaves of the trees are above the subject. The lighter tone leaves are behind the subject. And if I shot from a lower camera angle, then the hair color of their hair is going to compete with those leaves that are on the, from the trees. So this way, I'm able to frame the subject with the, the, the outdoor environment and capture something you know, quite pleasing to them um, and that, that has from a compositional standpoint is really quite beautiful too. Compositionally speaking, sometimes you just gotta, uh, um, you know, all those straight lines, straight up and down. Very seldom do I photograph a bride standing flat footed. This is the exception. Because if you look at all of everything, all of the energy is flowing from the top down. And this was a very important um, building for this particular couple. Um, they, um, uh, this is where the bride, she went to school that was attached to that place and to this particular mission. And so they had a, a great deal of significance 
there was a great deal of significance. And this one, of course, does have um, some treatment. Why did I use the treatment on this? Because look at the mission. It's got that gritty kind of look. It's very Adobe-esque. And that was very much the, um, the, the, that particular environment. So I chose to do it this way. And your eye goes right to the subject. You can see with these two images specifically how that higher camera angle um, really, really makes a huge difference. Having them play, notice how her shoulder is turned, is leaned into the groom a bit. You know, it's amazing what you, when you roll that shoulder in, it creates a more intimate look. Same is true with this subject. So I like people hugging a lot. I, I like them connecting. I want their bodies to be connected. So once I found the location where I'm gonna, I know it's gonna give me a pretty environment where, the, where I can work with the lighting the way I want it, then I'm gonna create vignettes like this one and this one. And I really, really love this. The, these kinds of images are gonna be, to me, what, what I really prefer to, to concentrate on is I wanna be able to capture that intimacy of a couple. And to me, it's all about those two, their faces, and just, it can be done very, very quickly. But again, it goes back to the way that it's lit, um, that the, the, the lighting is done. The lighting in this case is, a, is not quite flat lighting, it's actually coming from that um, that cement wall right behind them. It's it's really giving me a little bit of uh, of, uh, of of illumination on the bride's face. Whether I'm outside, composition matters. It really makes a difference. Golden Gate Bridge. We get this nice triangular shaped composition there, and then last but not least, we get this beautiful these wonderful expressions from our subjects that are just having a blast and you know getting them to enjoy the the fun experience um you know one of the things i really like that i think um can be a lot of fun in this picture you notice there's a little dumpster outside i could remove that in photoshop quite honestly i didn't notice it um because this is just this is um just out of camera but one of the things i like is by opening that window up just slightly notice how that shaft of light crosses my bride's face and the groom's face to really give me this wonderful image of uh, intimacy. In post-production, I'd either take out that, whatever is going outside that window, um, um, you know, or I would darken that substantially so that you didn't see it so much. Okay, reception photography is our last element. And it's gonna be, we're gonna sail through this because I'm, I'm, they're gonna kick me out of here. Oh my goodness, I've got like three minutes. So, oh, we're okay. Um, reception photography. I really believe that wedding receptions are very, very important. Again, um, I, I think you've seen probably by now that there's overlapping elements that go into every single wedding. That whether I'm photographing a bride walking down the aisle or a couple walking out to their wedding reception, be prepared. Have on the right lens to get the right job. Be in position. So I'm on a ladder again. In this case, I'm up on a ladder to be able to capture, to get to me what I would, what I wanted. Like I wanted those trees to be framing that, uh, the bride and groom as they walked out the door. So the same elements, just in a different location, a, a different kind of uh, environment. Um, sometimes I think it's important for us to, to have things in the background that are uh, framed in the stories in the foreground. So in history, this is the bride and groom in the foreground, toasting the dad or toasting with the father. And we did this in several different ways. And I think I've got something else to show you. So I can go that way, come around, photograph the, the bride's sister. Um, and because this moment is about her. So how's it being lit? Well, in this particular case, I'm using the videographer's light. The videographer standing off camera over here with his nice bright video light on. Thanks to high ISOs, I really felt that it was a much prettier image than I would have captured using flash. Do I use flash? Absolutely. When I need it, I'm going to use it. Um, a higher camera angle during first dances is just phenomenal for capturing beautiful expressions. This couple was very, the groom was quite much taller than I was. I love those little fingers. I feel like that just really says so much. So sometimes just dissecting the moment. So now I'm going to transition into showing you how I use um, strobes at a wedding reception. This is my reception diagram. This is, please note, this diagram is not to scale. High, higher ISO is used. 
And sometimes I'm even over 800 to 1,000. I'm, I'm not worried about my ISO, especially these days. It's just so, the, 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 uh, the Z9 is so phenomenal for that. Um, I use a speed light set to manual meter mode, or sometimes I'll use TTL. Um, and the output is determined by the distance from the speed light to the wall. Now you'll notice that the speed light is not turned, the, hip, the, the, the flash is not turned towards the subject. It's aimed at the wall, at a light colored wall. So a, a ballroom that has white walls or light colored walls like tan, um, a, a tented room that has white walls, um, things like that. This is when I'm gonna use this particular technique. Of course, there are times when I might need to turn the flash head towards the subject. And then at that point, I'll use a light modifier to soften the light. But why would I do this? I love, this is my favorite technique because when you aim a speed light at a white wall, guess what you have just created? A very large soft box. So you get beautiful soft light on your subject like this. See how there's really pretty soft light. We're getting that soft light coming on the cake. Um, they, these curtains, we aimed up the light just enough to where I could get soft light. And this, in this case, I'm balancing the soft light from the strobe with the video light from the videographer. Yes, the videographer also is giving me just a little bit of help in that as well. This is what it looks like using that soft box. See those, those, um, those, white, um, those white curtains? This is the nice, this is how pretty the lighting looks when you use that, that little bit of strobe bouncing off a wall. You can also bounce it. In this case, the walls, the, the ceiling was, had quite a steep slope. I don't aim that strobe straight up at the ceiling. Why? Because I don't want the ceiling to be bright. If it's super bright, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a distraction to the subject and you're not going to, um, you're not going to, it's going to take away from the subject. But sometimes when you're outside, we might use just a light outside showing that the, what people are doing, this is done just with candle, the candle light that was outside about 11 o'clock at night. But the great thing is, is when you're using these strobes, this is again, using that, that bit of, um, um, uh, soft light. It's super, super soft on the subject. So it looks much more natural. I really love this picture. It's one of my favorites. Photograph through something for a really interesting photograph of the bride and groom's first dance. This is a really cool way to create a, an image or a moment. And the, the only light that's being used is just from the, the, the lights in this, in this room. And then of course, using um, for a reception, I like to get their going away shot showing something very intimate of them as they leave. And in this case, for this couple, they were leaving in their elevator, um, just capturing that in just natural light that was just from the light fixture there. Getting people as they're walking away. I like to have a closer for a book. I feel that that's a real important um, element um, in, in creating a really nice story for anyone. Okay, so that's the presentation. So how am I doing, Dad? Tell me, let's go over questions. I don't know that we're going to have time to go through this. We'll get through as many as we can. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, do you have an assistant for you? Uh, I guess, do you have an assistant for you and the second shooter? Um, yes. Uh, I have an assistant for me always. And my second shooter actually is my assistant um, uh, the majority of the time but he's such a good shooter. I will use him for, um, um, you know, like if I, for instance, if I need a second camera angle for the church, the ceremony, groom getting ready kind of things, I'll, I want him to do that so I can concentrate. And then um, it, it depends on the size of the event, whether I will have an additional uh, assistant or whether he will have an additional assistant. The, if it's a very big, very expensive wedding, there'll be at least four of us, myself and an assistant, my my associate photographer and assistant if it's a, an average wedding that's not you know that is more manageable size then it may uh, be just the there'll be three of us and if it's a, a more intimate wedding then it may just be my my associate photographer and myself I don't really need too much uh, I mean I try to 
when I walk into a room, I don't really need too much to have someone assist me because I'm pretty well prepared on my own. Again, I take my time when I get there. I give myself plenty of time to do what I need. So I, I don't usually need um, an assistant to be work fluffing trains and stuff like that too often. So, um, but I never ever go to a wedding by myself. I want someone there with me that is qualified absolutely every time. Uh, we also had someone ask, how do you relax the couple or the subject so they're not nervous or stiff? Great question. <clears throat> it's all about getting them to interact with one another first. So the first thing I usually do <clears throat> is um, whether it be an engagement session, that's number one. If you can do the engagement session, get them to play a bit with one another. You know, have them just, you know, running down the beach, have them you know, walking towards you and then have them bump into each other. Just get them to, to engage with one another first. That is absolutely the key to a relaxed session. That's why the engagement session is so important to me because once I photograph them on the, uh, on the engagement session, first of all, they're way more comfortable with me. On the wedding day, if they're very stiff and very, uh, very nervous, I'm going to get them to shake it out. I mean, I will have a project say, I want you to shake it out. Just, just shake it out a minute and take a deep breath and relax. And um, that's why I feel that it's important to, to have a bit of personality and just, you know, treat them as you would, you know, as a human, you know, ask them questions about themselves. Like one of the things that I do is I'll go, what is it that you love about the guy you're marrying? What is this? Why do you, why do you want to marry him? And then shut up and actually listen. It's interesting to me to see how people, when they start thinking about something that's important to them, it comes over their face and then they become much more relaxed. And then you're having a conversation with somebody while you're clicking away. Let's see. Oh, in your experience, do females shooting brides getting ready work better? Not necessarily. Um, I used to think that. Um, but I don't think that anymore because I know some amazing photographers who, <coughs> who are able to capture incredible pictures of, of brides getting ready. Here's the trick. Here's what you have to do. First of all, that camera is up at your eye. When you have a camera up at your eye, you become invisible. So I know the photographers who've become the male photographers who've become successful at photographing brides getting ready. First of all, they just act nonchalant. I mean, you've seen more on a beach than you've seen that girl getting ready quite often. Communication is really important. So I find that uh, it, um, men, men who have pictures in their, in their uh, wedding portfolio, beautiful pictures of brides, very tastefully done of them getting ready that aren't showing you know, uh, uh, everything. Um, they paint the picture of what they do and the bride is much more comfortable with having them maybe be in that room. If, he's, if she's not comfortable, then that, that's one reason you'd want to hire a female photographer to work with you. So, but, but I do know many successful male photographers that do it all the time, but they have their camera at their eye and they're shooting and they shut up. They don't, they're not going to be in there, you know, drawing attention to themselves. I also had someone ask, uh, or someone said, I noticed you shoot mostly landscape. Is this uh, preferential? Um, actually, I have to tell you, actually, I don't shoot mostly landscape, but I'm trying to, I want to shoot more landscape because I find that the, um, you fill up the frame. It's to me, it's, it's more impactful in an album. If a, a landscape imagery is much more impactful to me than verticals, verticals kind of break things up a little bit. So I'm actually working towards shooting more landscape, um, than more vertical. Um, also, are you shooting uh, are you shooting some of the pictures in black and white or is that a post-processing no. decision? For me, it's always post. And the reason it is, is that I like to change my mind. And I, um, I am, when I'm in the moment, I'm so in the moment, I would not want to forget and then leave it on black and white. So for me, I just prefer to just shoot it all in color. And then I can change my mind however many times I want to. And I'm I'm, I'm good to go. Um, the filters that I use, the, the, the program that I use, Exposure 7, the black and whites are beautiful. I mean, it has, it has infrared, lots of infrared. It's got, you know, a, a variety of different um, 
uh, film em emulations, even recording film, old recording film that I absolutely loved in the film days. So um, there's a really, to me, no need for me personally to, to just shoot it all in black and white to begin with. I, I agree. I think it gives you more flexibility. You can make that decision after the fact if you want to. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the last question I'm seeing is, uh, how many weddings did you shoot until you considered yourself an expert? And uh, part two, what rookie error must we avoid? Oh, gosh. Oh, um, that's a really good question. You know, uh, <coughs> that's, a, that's a great question. I, I have no clue. I mean, because I've been photographing for 30 years, so I can't even remember that far back. You know, it's like, um, but I will tell you the biggest mistake I've ever made. Um, and this is like the one thing. And actually, that's a segue. Do we have about 10 or 15 minutes or do I need to stop? I do. I'm not sure if uh, how everybody else feels. Please, please let us know in the, in the, the comments. The uh, reason that I'm at, the reason I asked that is that that the answer to that question really segues into marketing because the most important lesson I ever, ever learned in photography is the importance of not pricing your services according to what you personally can afford. What do I mean by that? In other words, sometimes as a new photographer specifically, we will think, okay, well, I need to be the cheapest guy in town so that I can, so that I can, you know, get people to book me or hire me when it's not really about that. So let me show you what that means. This is my wedding contract in 1987. Do you see what I charged in 1987 to shoot a wedding? 436 or $426. You know, the sad thing is, you have any idea how many people actually charge that now? There are people today who charge that amount. And that was, you know, that was that's just ridiculous to be to, to charge such a small amount. And also, look at what I was giving them. They got four hours of photography. They got 100 previews. And that was in the film days. So you had to still have the stuff processed. And that was what they got. That's not what you shot. And then they got 24 8 by 10s or 12 8 by 10s and 35 by 5s in a book. So I was basically paying the client for the privilege of photographing their event. And of course, this is what they got. This is what you did back in 1987 as you photographed with that blue background. And again, there are many people who still do this kind of photography. They have never changed. And I really believe that it's important for us to adapt and to change. So the best advice I ever got from anyone was, uh, um, uh, was about in about 1989. And that was to um, not charge according to your own personal budget. Um, but in addition to that, there are some other things that are equally important. I have to go past this slide super fast because it's so horrendous, is keep your look simple. Sometimes photographers show every single picture that they've ever taken in their whole life. And then when they create their marketing material, they have, they get all cute with it and they have swirly cues. They learned a new trick in Photoshop and they have all this stuff going on and it totally, it just completely ruins your look. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to go through a series of pictures. This is very quick guys. I'm sorry, but I want to show you concepts. Where do you go for inspiration on your marketing material? Um, <clears throat> this is Christian Dior. This is, it was an exhibit I went to in uh, Paris. I absolutely love, 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 love fashion. Fashion rules the world. And it absolutely rules wedding photography. First thing bride does when she gets engaged. She goes to look at wedding gowns. She gets her bride's magazines, whether online or whether in the printed form. So that dress rules the wedding. That tells you, that dress tells you exactly who she is as a client. Um, is she the client like this woman who's very tailored, more uh, Catherine Hepburnish? Is she going to be very exotic like this, um, like uh, the, the designer of this particular kind of gown, this kind of dress? So is she more hip? Is she more, uh, is she more uh, ethnic? Those kinds of things. But even with these designers, look at how clean and simple this vision is. They're not showing you every single thing they've ever done. They're showing you two looks and then they have a support piece over on the, on the right-hand side. 
So not every subject is going to be the same, but what you learn about that subject by what they wear tells you volumes about them. And so I love fashion. Fashion tells me so much about who I'm working with. So I don't have to play 20 questions. I don't have to ask them, what kind of photography do you want? Because I find if you look at what they're wearing, that tells you volumes about what they want. That tells you who they are. Are they the Louis Vuitton girl? Or, and not that they even have to have Louis Vuitton, but are they that person that likes kind of the trench coat, kind of, kind of the casual kind of look with the hiking boots, that kind of thing? Um, the other thing you can learn by companies like Louis Vuitton, speaking specifically of, is you learn volumes about packaging and perception. This, I tell you, the light bulb came on in my mind when I was passing a, a storefront that had Louis Vuitton handbags. This is a, um, Louis Vuitton makes canvas and leather handbags, okay? I mean, this handbag can be three or $4,000 for a purse. So what have they done to take that tangible product and make it look special? They isolate it. And they make it look very, very special by certain things that they do. Here's an ad for Louis Vuitton. What are they selling? They're selling the experience. So what has Louis Vuitton done? They found a way to grab your attention to sell a purse. And look at the, there's only, if you look at the, the products, there's only one, two, three, four, five little, I don't know, four products in the whole scene. They're taking all that real estate up. So what does that mean? So in your marketing material or in the, the things that you give to clients, make them very impactful images, make Give them a, a, a reason to want to hang on to it. Do not show them the picture of the bride and groom standing in the church on the altar or those normal things that they can see in anyone's portfolio. If you do, all you're doing is telling them to go somewhere else and get it cheaper. So you want to show them imagery that's exciting and that's interesting, that gets, that gets them emotion. Color can be a very motivating thing. <clears throat> I love, love, love this picture. And I love how that they show... Um, they show the concepts of, of these different textures. So maybe you use this concept in the color scheme that you show, and I'm not saying for you to use red, <coughs> um, the textures that are done. It also tells you that there are certain, um, uh, there are certain fashion, there's certain fashion that goes in and out of style. And that also will dictate, in my opinion, the way that you photograph. To give you an example, and when I started in 1987 photographing weddings, um, the kind of photography bride with the big turkey thing on her head and it was very big poofy dresses and so forth. Well, in the early 90s, something really remarkable happened. You could not buy a bead on a dress. Dresses became very minimal. In the 90s, it became really cool to be, uh, you know, well, we want photojournalism. We want all photo. We don't want any of those posed pictures. So what does that tell you? It meant people wanted a more simplified style of photography. So do we take formal pictures? Of course, but I pulled back from manipulating every single scene. Style changes about every 10 years. And so I have found for me that in order for me to keep on trend, I adapt what I'm doing to, to the, the times. No, do I, I don't, I don't do cute tricks but I find that there are certain elements that will go into my marketing material. I'll give you an example. Can you point out the jewelry in this window? This is a Harry Winston. I just, I've had this in my slideshow for a long time and it just is so powerful. There's three little tiny pieces of jewelry in this window. There's a pair of earrings and a little pin over on the, um, on the, the butterfly net. So what does that tell us? So it tells us that the, we wanna find a way to attract people to us in a very uh, unique way. Find a way to, like, for instance, if you do bridal fairs, um, and I know a lot of people who are very successful at bridal fairs, um, make sure that you're doing something that's elegant, that's different, where you're showing images and showing um, something that's more interesting. Prada's another one who's been highly successful. I mean, think about it. It's a pair of shoes. You're going to spend a thousand dollars on a pair of shoes. And yet, what have they done to make those shoes look really special? So I hope you're kind of getting the point of this. This one cracks me up. This is Tiffany's. Where's the jewelry? It's one little tiny piece hanging off that, um, off that uh, background. But they're using, they have a color scheme. Tiffany's is known for their color scheme. Does your company have a color scheme? If you're a new photographer, do you have a color scheme? Make sure if you're a new photographer, you're not using colors that 
that are masculine because your clients are women. You're not going to, if you're a male photographer, one of the worst things you can do is have a black, um, have a, a black and red brochure because all you're doing is that's subliminal message, racing stripe. So you want to, and the typeface that you're using, what kind of typeface are you going to be using? Um, can you tell me what the jewelry is in this? I had to, I had to put the next slide in just so you'd see it. Um, notice how this is in a Tiffany's window. Do you notice how they've got that beautiful granite around it? So what are you, what can you do to make your product look very, very special and unique? There's the product. You can barely even see it in the, in the window. It cracks me up. So you want to think about typeface, the typeface that you're using for your particular style. Don't overdo it with bunches of stuff. Don't show them every picture you have ever shown. Um, um, clean and simple makes a huge difference. When you have very, when you have just a few, when it comes to an album plan, um, don't put every, uh, don't do a yearbook style. In other words, don't put tons and tons of pictures in those books because all you're doing is all the, the, the hero shots um, for this, I'm talking sample books. I'm not talking about client books. Um, all you're doing is just taking what you've done and you've made it, um, um, nothing has impact because they're all too small to really appreciate and see. So the moral of the story is, and that's why my, the moral of my story is, is not to price myself according to what I can afford. So what I do is I look at companies, tying this all back into photography, I look at companies that, uh, how are they getting people to buy their products? How are they getting them to do that? Do only rich people buy Louis Vuitton and uh, Christian Dior and, and Prada? No, a lot of normal people do those kinds of things. When, for instance, a young woman may have um, for her birthday, she may say, oh gosh, well, honey, I really want that beautiful Louis Vuitton handbag. I, I just really want that. Now he may have to save for six months to get that, but it's really special. It's for a special occasion. So we give ourselves permission on special occasions to spend more money. And so a wedding is one of those special occasions. So sometimes your worst, the worst thing you can do is charge a little because when you charge too little, all you're doing is saying, I'm not worth anything. And maybe in the beginning, you're not charging thousands of dollars, but then you wanna think about how much do I get to keep? Because you don't necessarily have to charge thousands of dollars to be making a very nice living at the craft of photography. If you're, um, if you're, if how much work is involved in what you're doing, how much product are you giving them? Um, you know, and don't just think about the clicks that you have to click. In other words, it, it's how much post-production do you have to do? So, you know, if you, if you shoot an event that takes you an hour to do and you charge a thousand dollars for it, and it takes you an hour to do the, to do your post-production, you're like, that's really a nice chunk of change. If you're making $500 an hour and it's a four hour job and you're, um, and, and you're only, and you're, you're just doing a raw edit and then you give a client, a, you know, your files or whatever, but they're beautiful. And you, and, and you have not taken 10,000 pictures that you've had to go through and retouch and edit and everything else. Then it may be something that you will, you'll actually be doing well financially because you're not giving the house away. The worst thing photographers can do is, is um, in my opinion, is copy other photographers' pricing because all you're doing is going to starve to death for sure. Because most photographers are lazy and they just want to copy somebody else instead of sitting down and calculating what it costs to do the job and to do it the way you want to do it. For my, in my case, I want to provide an album. I want my clients to have this beautiful, tangible product. I love that. That's a family heirloom. And it's the first family heirloom of what I will hope will be many. Um, one of the clients that you've seen in this slideshow today quite a bit, I have photographed three of the four daughters' weddings. The fourth one is coming up in October. Um, so I have a history. You develop history with people. I just flew down to Pasadena to photograph one of the daughters that I already photographed her wedding, her, her new baby. So you start developing this history with people. So I like personally tangible products. And um, so that's pretty much how I feel about it. And so if I'm gonna use tangible products, I'm gonna make sure that they're really high quality and I wanna use the best gear. <clears throat> I don't have tons of stuff, but what I have, I spend the money on. Number one, I want my cameras to be the best.
because I cannot photograph a wedding um, and, and have confidence that every click is going to matter and make a difference if I'm using inferior, poor quality cameras or lenses. That's why I'm very fussy about um, making sure that all my glass is Nikkor <clears throat> glass. And then the other lighting as well that I use is, is high quality. There's lots of lighting out there that's cheaper than Profoto by a long shot. But I've had mine for a long time and I never worry about it. It just is very hardy. It lasts forever. And I don't like to have to buy something new. So that's pretty much how I feel about that. <clears throat> no, I think that's great. Uh, and, and I did see a few other uh, comments. Yes, this is being recorded. And uh, all of the attendees will receive an email uh, about uh, 24 hours after we finish here uh, with a link to this recording. So you will be able to watch this over again. And so you can, you can fill in your notes <laughs> because Bambi, you gave us a lot of really good information. Uh, I, I, know, much. <laughs> I think it was, you know, it was, it was definitely worth uh, every minute <laughs> because weddings are not, they're not headshots and they're not product. It's, it's, it's an event. And uh, like you said, you know, this is a lot like you're talking about that bag, you know, you, you may save up, you know, six months, nine months for that bag. If, you know, if you're in a different, uh, you know, different income bracket, but it's, it's an experiential thing. It's, it's, it's something special. And it's, you know, I, I've, you know, talked to friends about this. I'm like, yes, wedding photography, you know, can be pretty expensive, but you're not doing it every year. At least I hope you're not getting married every year. You know, <laughs> I mean, it'd be great for you, Bambi, but yeah. <laughs> But, but no, you know what? There is nothing like having a client come to you that you photographed their wedding and now they're hiring you to photograph their child's wedding. It, it just, I'll tell you what, it just doesn't get better than that. And I've, I mean, at this point in my career, I've been photographing for so long, a number of my clients over the thousands that I've, I've worked with in the past are hiring me to photograph. I've been their family photographer since the day their children were born. And now I've photographed their wedding, their children's, uh, you know, growing up and uh, excuse me, and now their children's wedding. So it just comes full circle. And it's really such a privilege. I, I can't believe I get paid to do this. And I'm really still very thrilled that and honored that people still hire me to, to photograph their events. Absolutely. Cause it definitely is. It, it this is a technical art form, but it's also, uh, specifically with this is it's a, uh, a relational, uh, type thing as well. Well, I think that's all we have for everybody. Uh, I know we went a little bit longer, but you know what? I think it was well worth it with all the information we got. Uh, but I, you know, tell everybody, thank you for coming. Bambi, thank you. Terrence, thank you very much. Uh, I hope to see, you know, more, uh, live stream events like this. And, uh, I hope everybody has a great day. Me too. You guys have a great day. Okay. Thank you so much for letting me be part of the team today. Absolutely. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank everybody. you very much. Goodbye. Bye.